in music there is life and in life there is music. Welcome everyone to another Meet Our Members interview. Our guest of the week is Peggy Shao. Welcome Peggy, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Shannon. It's great to have you. So let's dive right in. Could you share a little bit about how you got into music and specifically into sacred music and playing the organ whenever that came in? <laughs> I guess with a lot of people, it starts at home. And my parents um, were musical. They both played the piano. And my brothers took up instruments, trumpet and trombone. And there was music in the house. Um, we didn't perform as a family group until my brother started a combo when we were in school and I was part of that. But um, my mother was a big influence. And then I had a very good teacher when I started school and she was encouraging all the way up through grade six for that school, um, taught piano and also the recorder. And uh, that was back in the late 40s, <laughs> when there was a renaissance of the recorder at that time. So th that was pretty special, especially later on. My mother was a volunteer church organist in our small town in North Carolina, where I grew up. And it was a Baldwin organ. And uh, she was there every Sunday. And when I began to play, I could play anytime I wanted to. Um, and that sparked my interest in the organ. Uh, but I had piano lessons, of course, too. And during the summer, I think when I was about maybe 12 or 13, uh, she had me take lessons with a woman who had who was studying at Oberlin, studying organ. And she was home for the summer. She was a student. And she started me on more serious playing on the organ. And I just, I, I brought along one of the books that we started with, you know, when I was at, at that age, which um, the Dupre variations on Bach chorales. Mm. And that, that was just wonderful. And from there, I went on to uh, have lessons with someone else and alternated piano and organ during high school mm. and um, took over my mother's job at the organ <laughs> when I was in high school and to give her a little bit of relief. So it kind of evolved that way. Okay, so it's in your blood from your mother. And <laughs> yeah, what, that's wonderful. So you said you were learning piano and organ, you would kind of alternate at the same time. What ultimately drew your you particularly to the organ? Well, um, I then I went to college and my first year I decided to do piano okay. uh, and see how I felt about the organ. And my college had a wonderful four manual molar organ. And I decided at the end of my first year that I, I would study organ and I became a, an organ major. And during my junior year, I think it was Jean Langlais came to the college, gave a recital and also a master class. And I played in the master class and he's a very outgoing, friendly person. And, you know, later on, a couple of years later, I was in touch with him again. And as a result of that, I ended up studying with him in Paris for a while. And that really cemented things for me with the organ. Right. What did you play in that first master class? I played. Um, a little piece called Scherzo Cats. Cats. <laughs> and it's by from Longley. his, by Longley. Okay. It was the first time he had heard it performed because it had just been published and, or performed by somebody else. And it's part of his American suite. So it was just a fun piece. And I didn't think anything particular about it until later on when I wanted to contact him and I said, maybe you remember that I played that piece in a master class, and and indeed he remembered, and uh, so 
Oh, that's wonderful. If I could was, ask a follow-up question, what was it like to study with Jean Longley? It was great. It, it wasn't for a full year, but it was, um, it, it was wonderful. He was, it was a wonderful person, friend, and um, because he was blind, of course, and I learned a lot about how he navigated and learned a little bit of Braille so that I could later write to him. And um, a wonderful musician, composer, and I wish that it had been a longer time, but um, yeah, it was very special. Mm. Wow, what a privilege, that's awesome. Um, so going on, what are some of your proudest moments in your work as a sacred musician or at the organ and some highlights that you'd like to share? I suppose, um, yeah, there are a lot of highlights for sure. I, I, it wasn't a straight line for me. I was always kind of zigzagging to and from music, even, I mean, music was really important to me, but um, I, I did another kind of job for a couple of years. And then I ended up meeting my husband uh, who was on his way back to Taiwan <laughs> and in order for us to commit, sort of know what this relationship was, I had to go to Taiwan and we were married there. And I, he had told me that if I came there it would definitely be work for me to do, not just teaching English, which I did, but also teaching organ and the school had a very old uh, little pipe organ, tracker organ that had been donated from a church in America. And it indeed was falling apart and had many problems, but I, I loved learning about the organ and could go inside and fix things if I needed to and taught quite a few students. It was a um, Tainan Theological College and Seminary, and there were students in the music department who were required to take a semester of organ. And even though they didn't get very far, I, this was the book that I used to teach them, the Peter's Little Organ Book. Um, I had maybe five new students every semester, so it was quite a challenge because a lot of them didn't really take to it, but some did and did very, very well. And I was really proud of all of the students for that. And at the same time, another thing I was, um, that was special to me was uh, getting involved in children's music. And I, with some other uh, teachers from Taiwan, developed a children's music center that uh, was was quite successful, I think, and exciting for several years. And it was, a, it was a nice balance with the seriousness of the organ and the playfulness of the children's music. So I enjoyed those years a lot. Oh, wonderful. Do you have a favorite composer or era of music that you prefer? It's got to be Bach. <laughs> I know that's true for a lot of organists. And for me, it probably started with my mother again. It was, uh, Bach was her favorite, I think. And uh, from a young age, she, with her, her mother and sister and aunt from in Philadelphia, where she lived, attended the Bach Festival in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And that was really in her blood from early part of the 20th century. And she passed on her love for that music to us. And eventually then I be, was able to go and we still go every year that we can to the festival. But also with the organ, of course, you, you learn Bach very early on. And in high school, I, I did a term paper on Albert Schweitzer. And that was just one more level of getting to know the organ and Bach and uh, the first editions that I have of Bach's music are the Schweitzer editions. So Bach just makes sense, it brings everything together on so many levels. And even if it's not the organ, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I think even during this pandemic time, 
Um, I haven't been playing the organ, certainly, but um, sometimes on the piano, I'll go to the well-tempered clavier or the inventions or the French suites and, or sometimes just listen to the Goldberg variations. And you just go through so many different levels of beauty and of emotion and skill techniques of composing. It's beautiful. Do you have a favorite work by Bach at the organ that you enjoy playing? Oh, I, it's hard to say. I do love the um, the fugue in E flat, the St. Anne fugue. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorites, but I also love the chorale preludes, many of them. Hard to say. <laughs> yes, there's so much. Thank you. Next question. If you had to offer advice to organists starting out in their career, what would you share? Oh my, I think first of all, that music is such a big field that, you know, whatever talent you have, whatever level you achieve, you have, you're a part of it, of music. And you have something of value to share with other people. So follow your passion and find ways to share that. And another thing would be to try to develop a broad foundation in music, not only with playing a, an instrument or maybe another instrument in addition to the organ is, would be really good. Um, but also in theory and um, I always wish that I had learned how to improvise as I was learning piano and also how to teach that as, as piano teacher. And I was not very successful in doing that. Um, but I think that skill is really important as an organist. And um, I'm glad that I'm a good sight reader because I think that's really, really important too. Um, so a broad foundation in music and Another thing would be to take time for other things. Um, other things, especially that uh, help to develop your artistic sense. And these will apply to music and understanding music, communicating uh, through music, but also just communicating and working together with other people. Teamwork is so important mm -hmm. um, to a music career. So, there's a, there's a lot to music, but there's a lot beyond music that impacts how you're able to share your music. It's interesting <laughs> how, how much of life does intersect with music. I mean, music is a part of life, but really everything feeds into each other. There's so many intersections. It's It not, does. And it reminds me that one of the sayings or I don't know where it came from maybe just my head I used to emphasize to my students that in music there is life and in life there is music because you you find music everywhere and this came to me really strongly when I was involved in children's music and also for many years I was teaching a group of uh, developmentally disabled children in Taiwan and to see how music evolves from a person, no matter their ability or not. And, um, it, and then seeing and hearing music all around in nature, in, in traffic, in, you know, wherever. It, and it's all part of the big fabric of music. It's like the circle of life. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a yeah. wonderful quote. Yeah. What brought you to the AGO? And you were a member for a, a long time and now you're retired from active career, but still a member, right? So what has, what has that journey looked like for you? Well, I think I have known about the AGO for a long, long time, long before I was a member. Um, I mean, for 18 years, I was living in Taiwan, so I, I was not a member or active then. And um, when we moved to New Jersey in 1986, um, 
Soon after that, I took courses at Montclair State, uh, was studying with John Gillick for Oregon mm -hmm. and met some wonderful friends. Carolyn Steen uh, was one of them. And we all were studying with John Gillick and formed a very close friendship. And she kept kind of pushing me to join the AGO chapter that she was part of, the Northern New Jersey chapter. And eventually I did, and um, then served as secretary on the board for, for a number of years. So I got to know wonderful people, very talented people, could see the local level, the regional, the national, and then eventually the international because they then had a chapter in Taiwan. And I had a, a connection with that too. The, the AGO has introduced not just people and lots of music, but um, programs, wonderful programs, um, a lot of new repertoire through going to recitals and uh, master classes and um, organs, just learning more about the different kinds of organs. And that's been fascinating. And what would you say are <clears throat> the, the top things that you've gleaned as a member that you would recommend maybe people who are considering to join the AGO reasons for, for considering? Reasons to join the AGO? Mm -hmm. um, well, first to make contacts with other people who have perhaps similar interests and to expand your, your musical interests and experience, uh, to learn more about the organ as an instrument, the different kinds of organs that there are, the organ builders, the many people that sort of go into making an organ and making decisions, and about churches um, and some of the, the issues that they have with in church music in these days, how they try to keep music alive in churches and honor the traditions that we have. Uh, I think those are important reasons to be part of a larger, something bigger than yourself. <laughs> um, so if you, if you have a concern for church music and the importance of music in people's spiritual lives, I think the AGO is a, a very, very valuable in, uh, organization. And I should have mentioned at some point that my, the longest that I have served one church, of course, was in um, the Presbyterian Church in Rutherford, New Jersey. And that was sort of the icing on the cake for me <laughs> because it was at a time in my life when I wasn't really looking for a job or expecting a job, certainly not that I would stay for 15 years. I think partly because of my joining the AGO, um, there was the support and encouragement to, to do that job and to really get everything out of it that, that we could. So that was important. Speaking about that job where you, you brought such joy for so many years, um, you were a big part of the instrument being renovated at that church and you played an integral role in that campaign. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and you well know, I mean, Shannon, you're in that same church and, and keeping all those things alive. <laughs> that was such an honor for me to be part of that organ restoration project. Um, the organ is um, a, wonderful three manual molar organ uh, was built in 1967, as you know, and uh, the organist at that time was John Rodland. And the Rodland family uh, certainly is known in this area for its music. And um, the, the consultant for the organ was Robert Baker of the Sacred School of Music at Union Seminary at that time. So it was a beautifully designed organ and um, then eventually, you know, began to have some problems. Um, it needed an overhaul of the leather and cleaning and 
uh, revoicing and lots of things. So all of that was done. And then we got into the digital discussion and I learned a lot about that. And um, as a result of, of getting to know the Walker company and the digitals, that the few digitals that we agreed on to add to the organ, um, it also resulted in a second organ <laughs> for the church, a, a Walker digital organ that is in our chapel and is very useful for a different setting and was, I think, a, a really good thing that the church could do that as well. Absolutely. I personally benefit from both of those instruments as the musician and can attest to their excellence and how much the congregation still enjoys them. So, yes. That's good to hear. I'm sure you make the most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. Well, at the end of our interviews, we always leave an open question. If you'd like to share anything else with our audience, if you have any thoughts, feel free. I think one thing is that, you know, when you get into the, the organ world, it, it really um, can lead in so many directions. And as I said, in Taiwan, it led me to, you know, actually get inside an organ and try to learn how to fix it. Um, in Rutherford, I went to play the organ, but then part of my job was also directing the choir. And I had never really, I'd never done that for adults. And I was a little bit uh, intimidated about that, but I stuck with it and they stuck with me, thankfully. <laughs> and so, you know, that was just another thing that was added to the joy of, of making music. And um, that was very special. I'm just so grateful for all the people that, you know, I've been able to, to get to know and uh, to work with along the way and um, the give and take that there is. And it's, it's part of music, but it's also a very personal thing. Well, great. Thank you so much for being here with us and have a great night and we'll see you again real soon. Thank you, Shannon.